and welcome to another edition of Hard Copy, the program where we bring you the people behind the news. I'm Maupe Ogun. Now, on January 17 this year, over 100 people were killed and many more injured in Ran community, which has played host to a number of internally displaced persons fleeing the conflict caused by Boko Haram terrorists in other parts of Borno State. The Nigerian military owned up to the bombings, saying it was accidental. This was how Major General Lucky Irabo, the military commander in charge of Operation Lafia Dole, reported it. We received reports of the gathering of Boko Haram terrorists around somewhere in Kalabagi local government area of Brazil State. We got the coordinate and um, I directed that um, the air should go to address the problem. Unfortunately, the strike was conducted, but it turned out that um, the locals somewhere in Iran were affected. The military chief of the Air Force, which was directly involved in the incident, also said, It's uh, very tragic, very unfortunate, uh, but I want to assure you that as a professional service, we'll continue to evaluate our processes and procedures so that we can be effective in dealing with those that are out to kill human beings. Now, for a lot of Nigerians and the international community, this accidental bombing raises the question of protection for civilians in situations of conflict, particularly those cut up in an unconventional war, such as a counterinsurgency. Tonight, I speak with retired Group Captain Sadiq Shehu, who is a Regional Program Manager, Nigeria and Lake Chad Basin region of the Center for Civilians in Conflict. He's also an expert in international humanitarian law and human rights law in military operations. Just stay with us. Retired Group Captain Sadiq Sheho, you're welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you very much, Mope. Now, you have served in many capacities, both as a military man and now out of service. You now served the civilian populace. What would you consider the, some of the issues most misunderstood in situations of conflict? Uh, what I find, uh, what could bring, uh, you know, misconception about conflict places is first of all, you know, we, we tend to understand that uh, when there is a conflict in a general area, that the people that are caught up in the conflict themselves cannot do anything. But uh, my experience has shown that uh, there's always a coping capacity and there are always some certain resilience that is built in the communities, which uh, when you are looking for solution, you should not look at top-down approach. You should always involve the communities because uh, in any case, you as a person, either military or humanitarian, bring assistance, you are coming from the outside. Certainly, the short time that it took you to deploy, you may not know everything about the social dynamics, the community dynamics. So this is where you need to involve the people, and you don't have to look at them as completely helpless. They might be able to offer some uh, very unique and uh, indigenous solutions to what you are looking for. I was talking about that in respect to how the military, for instance, perceive the civilian population, which sometimes they're trying to protect, or, and in some instances how the civilians perceive the military, uh, who might be trying to protect them, but in all instances might be going about it in ways that could create even more conflict. Yes. Um, so you, now you are talking in the domain of civilian military coordination during mm -hmm. conflict. Yes. Uh, there is a tendency if you don't put elaborate communication between the people bringing the support, that is the military, and the people on the ground, that is the communities. Throughout, right from planning to deployment and even post-conflict, there has to be continuous communication between the military that are coming in to give support and the people that are on the ground. Yes, uh, by nature of uh, the military, generally, it is uh, normally a conservative, very close, uh, very close uh, organization. You know, sometimes resistant to change, I can say that. 
and uh, you, there's tendency sometimes not to divulge all information. That is understandable because honest as a security actor, it is not everything that you have to divulge. But uh, you might find sometimes that there's the, the over tendency to hide every bit of information. What I believe is that uh, at each stage or at each occasion, a careful assessment can be done. What is it that the civilians need to know and which will not jeopardize operational security? and then you release that information. From what you've seen so far yeah. in terms of elaborate communication between the military and the civilian populace, uh, do you think that we have that, considering the war that we have been fighting, especially in the northeast of the country? Uh, I will say there is. However, like in every system, there's always room for improvement, and uh, there's always a better way of doing something. The communication in general between the security and the, uh, and the civilian populace has improved when we look back over the years. Before, uh, I am 50 years old now, I remember there were times that uh, you dare not come and ask security people about anything. You know, we've had uh, incidents of uh, even uh, 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 journalists being shaved with bottles by, but now, with the advent of communication, both the media, the social media, I think I am seeing more and more realization on the military that they need to communicate what you are doing is very important. I can give you an example. About uh, five years ago, probably I think not all the services have a full-time public relations officer. Now, if you look from the military to the police to other paramilitary agencies, they all have full-time public relations officers. In some, in some uh, instances, they call them civilian military coordination officers or something of that sort. And if you look at the evolution of these uh, offices, and the fact that these offices are manned by very senior, I think all the services, they have people of general rank that are holding these positions. So to me, this uh, shows you the, you know, the, the, the dawning realization on the military and all other security forces that communication between the security forces and the civilian is very, very important. Credibility is yes. another item that is extremely important. Yes, the you know avenues of communication might have opened up over time, but then there's also the question of whether or not people believe uh, the spokespersons when they usually come out uh, because of a lack of sometimes transparency in terms of how did you know government dealings are done, especially within the armed forces. Uh, how important would you say the element of transparency is, and how do you think it can be entrenched? Well, transparency to me, when you're talking about uh, civil military coordination, it involves coming out with information as promptly as possible. Again, I know the security man has to, link up, uh, has to think of uh, operational security. What is it that if I divulge will affect my operations? Of course, there are issues that if you divulge will affect operations, you can give them. But there are some benign uh, information that will be useful to the civilians and in, in no way it will jeopardize operations. I think security forces should be quick to recognize this and come out with information. Sometimes there's always the tardiness of coming out with information until another source brings it out. Now it's from there the issue of credibility comes into it. For example, uh, if an incident happens, if maybe the military incurs some casualty, uh, I think uh, the military profession, it takes it as a prerequisite that casualties will be incurred, even though we try to minimize them. I think it will be good for the military force to come out and say we have incurred such and such casualties. As long as the nest of kin have been informed beforehand, of course that is another uh, requirement. You need to tell somebody, uh, a wife whose husband is in the front lines, what has happened to her husband before you go open. But that should be done quickly. Now, this will endanger, you know, trust. And again, if you don't have the information, you say this is what we have. But we will investigate and then we'll get back to you. And when you say I'll get back to you, make sure you get back and explain what you found out. That's another line. It was seem that has been used often and maybe almost abused because mm. oftentimes when we hear, we will get back to you. Yes, but people... Most people, times nothing happens. Yes, people keep count and that harms credibility. If uh, we'll get back to you becomes a swan song, every time we'll get back to you and you never do, of course that will affect credibility. So when you say we'll get back, please do get back. Again, like I said, there are always items that uh, the civilians may need to know. But the essential things that are harmless to your operations, make sure when you say, I'm getting back, you go back.
and right. tell them. That endangers credibility. So when next time you, and also be prompt in reacting, like I said, don't allow the story to break from somewhere and then you react. Are you seeing that already? I mean, you are coming from a military perspective mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you, have, you have a military background. Mm -hmm. You were once a spokesperson of the military. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? And are you still seeing that now? Uh, well, let me put it this way. I used to see it less often before, but I see it more often now. However, like I said, there's always room for improvement. There are things that can be done better. But uh, honest, I think uh, we have come a long way. Before, you don't find the military explaining certain actions. They just, you know, uh, all the security forces, they don't offer any explanation. But now whatever comes, you know, we have the military giving their own side of the story. Of course, it may be believed or it may not be believed. But the effort of communicating has increased over the years from the time I joined the military to now. Mm. Like I said, in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, opening offices, putting contact persons, putting focal points who speak on behalf of the military, having uh, military magazines. Uh, I think recently I even see going forward by opening a radio station for the military. Yes. On January 17th mm -hmm. this year, mm -hmm. there was a bombing, an accidental bombing in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, which came out, well, shortly after the military did admit that that happened. They, caught, they said it was regrettable. Um, but you have also talked on that matter. I think in an interview you granted to my colleagues uh, this year, you spoke about a fog of war uh, that could be responsible for that uh, sort of accident happening. Uh, how probable do you think that fog of war could be, considering the fact that you know, that accident happened within the morning to afternoon periods? Well, when I talk of fog of war, you know, it shouldn't be taken literally. What I mean is that uh, in a war situation, nothing is so clear and straightforward. Uh, on the side of the person leading the operation, he has multiple channels of communication. Some of the uh, uh, sources of communication are within the military itself. Some could be without the military. You need time to assess that information, to confirm based on the credibility of the sources, if it is an old source that you are dealing with, sometimes it is a source that is giving you information for the first time. That is on the one hand. On the other hand also, there is need for you to move quickly and seize the opportunity that has been given by that, uh, you know, by that information you obtained. So all this adds to the confusion of war. This is what is meant by the fog of war. So the commander, uh, you know, the picture is never complete. The picture is never complete because... On the one hand, if you are too hasty in reacting, you may make an error that will mean either the loss of lives, not only for other people, even of your own troops. On the other hand, if you delay again so much, you might miss the opportunity, as you know, surprise is one of the elements of war. However, a good commander is the one who balances the need to be fast to react and also the need to confirm information before you act. Uh, it is not, uh, there's no magic bullet which says if you do this, you will not get casualties. But balancing the need for acting quick and also the need for confirming information that is given to you, which could be contradictory, sometimes it is false. You have to follow every lead. That is what makes a very effective commander and from an ordinary commander. And that is what makes the difference sometimes between people losing their lives and having an operation that has minimal collateral damage. Now, looking at the, uh, a lot of people still cannot picture, mm. I mean, and, and maybe a lot of people do not quite understand, you know, the circumstances that could have led to that. Uh, do fighter jets fly blind? Um, well, when you say fighter jets, fighter jets are of different categories and they're the different capabilities. Uh, they are, uh, and again, depend, you, now you're talking of two variables, mm. the machine itself and the man flying the machine. Uh, for the machine itself, depending on the instrumentation, de depending on the characteristics of one machine over the other, there are machines that have the equipment that can fly blind and help the pilot with minimal error. That is for the machine itself. For the, fa for the uh, operator of the machine, that is the man himself, it is a function of skill. Here, skill is a compound of training and experience. Even in flying training, you know, there are, there are fighters that, I mean, there are pilots that can fly almost blind. That is, no matter what the weather is, they know how they can navigate. But that is another aspect of higher training. What I mean is not every pilot that can, that can fly during a deteriorating weather. But here we have to be careful. As you know, there are investigations going on. To be honest with you, there are so many variables we don't know. 
Well, we'll have to take a moment now. When we come back, we'll talk about the peculiarities of fighting uh, a war, uh, especially when it's an insurgency, and the peculiarities involved in that, and how it is that you know military-civilian relationships can be improved in that regard. Thank you. Do join us again.